Africa uh, an emerging partner. Uh, our guest, as you know, is Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of State Todd Moss, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of African Affairs. Uh, Dr. Moss uh, is a graduate of Tufts University. His PhD is from the London, the University of London, uh, their School of Oriental and African Studies. He uh, has published a couple of works among his, his several publications of, of particular interest uh, to us this evening. Uh, one has to do with uh, uh, globalization and uh, uh, the political economy of the stock market in Africa. And I hope there are people from T. Rowe Price here listening. <laughs> Theirs, as you know, is a recent fund developed in that, that area. He also has written on uh, African uh, development aid, uh, sorting out the issues and actors involved. He's uh, worked with the uh, World Bank, with the, with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and taught both at Georgetown and the London School of Economics. His, uh, experience prior to coming to the State Department was with the Center for Global Development. And in that capacity, he worked largely on U.S.-African uh, relations and also on uh, uh, questions of uh, the financial, financial aspects uh, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, among the problems he worked on was the Nigerian debt, uh, the crisis in Zimbabwe, uh, and of course the African uh, uh, Development Organization. In short, his experience has been uh, deeply involved in Africa, uh, hugely in economics. His present responsibilities in the Bureau uh, focus upon uh, economic issues and West Africa. I'm Looking forward to this with great interest myself. I'm sure you are as well. It's my great pleasure to present to you the Honorable Todd J. Moss. Thank you, Dr. Berg, uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm always happy to talk about Africa. Um, I'm usually used to talking about it uh, in an unofficial capacity where I can say whatever I like, so I'm still adjusting to uh, speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. Um, so uh, <laughs> I hope you'll bear with me on that. Um, I'm uh, uh, especially pleased to be here in Baltimore with you today. Uh, as uh, we look out at, at, the, at the beautiful port and we can see industry, uh, Baltimore is actually an ideal place to talk about the growing opportunities for U.S. business in Africa and the growing importance of Africa to U.S. strategic interests. Um, I think this is an aspect that, um, uh, that isn't fully appreciated, although I think we're starting to see that change quite a bit. Now, of course, I hope many of you know that Baltimore's links with Africa go back centuries. Uh, Baltimore and its ships were central to the settlement of, uh, of Liberia, a country that I work on uh, every day. Uh, in 1834, the Maryland State Colonization Society established a settlement uh, that was called the Republic of Maryland. Uh, and that settlement soon became part of Liberia, and today it's now called Maryland County, which is the, the southernmost part of Liberia. Uh, Baltimore's uh, oldest sister city relationship is with a town called Banga, uh, Liberia, uh, and this has continued as Liberia has gone through a, a brutal and uh, very long civil war. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to say that things there have gotten uh, much better. In June last year, uh, Banga's mayor uh, and four members of the Liberian House of Representatives were here in Baltimore, uh, and they met with uh, Mayor Dixon. Um, I was also happy to learn that uh, McCormick and Company is a sponsor of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. They, of course, have, been a long, have had a long-time presence in Madagascar and the, some of the surrounding islands in, in the Indian Ocean, uh, where they buy vanilla and cloves. Uh, the Port of Baltimore, also a sponsor of the Council, has direct Africa links. I'm told that the Grimaldi Atlantic Container Line now has direct freighter service uh, to West Africa, uh, including uh, Nigeria and Senegal. 
Um, so as Baltimore and Africa share deep and historical links, I'm happy to talk to you this evening uh, about U.S. policy toward Africa and our growing engagement with the continent. So what I think I'll do is I will give a kind of broad overview of how we think about U.S. Uh, policy in Africa, how we think of our interests, what are the ways that we engage with Africa, how some of this has changed recently, and then maybe in the questions I can get some of the, the, the specifics. I'll, I'll guess at a couple of questions and answer uh, at the end. Uh, the first thing is that Africa um, uh, is still a very, very young continent. Uh, Ghana was Africa's first nation in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence from, uh, from European uh, colonizers and just last year celebrated its, its 50th anniversary of independence. Now this is both cause for reflection uh, on Africa's ups and downs over the last half century, but uh, to me it really is, is an important reminder that how young these countries uh, are. Um, I should also note uh, that uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of the Bureau of African Affairs at the State Department. Uh, it was created by President Eisenhower, and we'll have a series of events in and around Washington to celebrate uh, the, 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 uh, that anniversary. Now, Africa, I know, uh, seems to just be a, a deluge of bad news and crisis, uh, but actually the last few years have been a pretty good time for Africa. In the last seven years, um, uh, we have seen the end of at least seven major conflicts in Africa. That's in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, North-South War in Sudan, uh, the Ethiopia-Eritrea War, and in Angola. I'm happy to say that the signs are very good that we are, we are really on the verge of a peace deal in northern Uganda as well. Um, and now, there are still, of course, ongoing conflicts in places like Chad and Darfur, um, and, uh, and the, the peace in the countries I've just mentioned uh, is, of course, very fragile. Uh, but I do think that the overall trend is toward conflict resolution in Africa. Uh, more importantly, we're seeing the capacity of African nations uh, to deal with conflicts. Uh, we're seeing that capacity uh, grow every day. Uh, African peacekeepers in particular are increasingly active not only across Africa but in the rest of the world. Democracy also is clearly on the rise in Africa. Uh, in the past four years alone, we've had at least 50 democratic elections held on the continent. Almost three quarters of the, of the African nations right now are classified by Freedom House, a think tank in Washington, uh, as free or partly free. And this is up from less than half as recently as 1990. Now, of course, it's worth remembering that even as this progress is quite remarkable, democracy is rarely linear. It's often a very long process, usually very bumpy. Things often get worse before they get better. And also that democracy, we, we focus on elections, but that democracy is not really about elections. It's about a long-term transformation of a society. Um, now, of course, uh, elections need to be credible. And when they're not credible, they can, in fact, be a source of conflict and tension. We saw this in Nigeria last year. We saw it, unfortunately, very recently in Kenya. And I think we're, it's possible, in, for, in fact, maybe likely that we're going to see it in a couple weeks in Zimbabwe, where they're holding uh, an election that uh, all the signs look like uh, it's going to be disputed and, and not, not very well run, certainly not credible. Uh, now, most starkly, um, I think that it's clear that Africa is going through a very real and very significant economic resurgence. Um, uh, thank you for mentioning my, my economic and financial background, so I do have a little bit of a, of a bias in that direction, but I think that the numbers are now starting to support that. African uh, real GDP growth last year was about 6.5%. Uh, that's the highest in memory, and this is at a time where inflation in Africa is actually in single digits. Uh, and we're now uh, expecting, along with the IMF, that high growth and low inflation will continue this year, even as the global economy starts to go through a little bit of a slowdown. Now, the success, this economic success in Africa is not just a handful of oil countries. We've got about two dozen African countries that are growing at at least 5% uh, per year. There's really only one nation, again, Zimbabwe, which is going backwards quickly. Now, this is a direct result of the, the absolutely disastrous policies of President Mugabe and his scorched earth policy to cling to power uh, at any cost. 
Uh, now, that sad nation is unfortunately ending, entering now its ninth consecutive year of a contracting economy, and inflation now is more than 100,000 percent, which is something that's it's, it's mind-boggling. It's I actually, from an economics point of view, it's, it's virtually a meaningless number. It just means that prices are going up within the day. Um, and uh, and we're, seeing, we're seeing things like the currency. Um, uh, the currency is going from six million uh, local dollars, local Zimbabwe dollars, to one U.S. dollar. And if, uh, last week and this week, it's over 20 million. So we're really seeing just this rapid, uh, uh, rapid escalation. Uh, but fortunately, Zimbabwe is really quite an anomaly uh, to the rest of the continent. Now, the striking thing about Africa, to me at least today, is its massive uh, economic potential. Now, the last half century, Africa has seen actually quite slow growth uh, on a per person average basis. The last 25 to 30 years, it's pretty much been zero. So the average African is right about where they were uh, 20, 25, 30 years ago. Um, uh, but um, after this past half century of growth, things, things are certainly looking better. Now, one of the things that uh, I, I think is striking is how small African economies still are. Now, this is because it, they've grown slowly for the past 30 years, but also because, because of historical accident, uh, because of a conference table in Berlin at the end of the 19th century, they, a continent has been chopped up into many, many tiny different units that don't make any sense. And so now we've got lots of little national economies that are all cut up. Now, I, I took a look at the numbers, and the, the, the size of Baltimore's economy as a city uh, is about 10 times, just the city of Baltimore is about 10 times the size of the entire economy of Ghana. Now, Nigeria, we think of as a big economic powerhouse. It's the fifth largest source of, of U.S. imported oil. Well, Baltimore alone is more than twice the size of the Nigerian economy. In fact, Baltimore is bigger than any African economy except South Africa, and not by much. Um, now, these positive economic pictures, starting from a low base, lots of small economies, but really starting to pick up, is partly being driven by global commodity prices. I'm sure you've seen what gold is going for right now, copper, platinum, oil. A lot of the, the, the traditional things that drive these economies are going way, way up. Um, but there's, it, it's more than that. There are economic reforms that have been going on, mostly for the last 20 years, inside Africa that are starting to now pay some dividends. Macroeconomic reforms. Uh, undertaken over, especially over the past decade. Now, this is with help from the U.S. government, with uh, help from the World Bank, with the IMF, other international partners. That has really brought down inflation into single digits, uh, and it's made the investment climate much, much friendlier. Now, there, countries still have a long way to go. I think a lot of the micro reforms, so if the, the budget is in pretty good shape and the, the, the economy from 10,000 feet looks pretty good, when you're an average entrepreneur and you want to start a business or you want to register your business, you want to pay your taxes, those micro reforms uh, are still, Africa is still a very difficult place to do business for, for the average person. Uh, so it's these micro reforms that, that countries are now looking at that en will enable people to, if they get it right, enable people to open, operate, and grow small businesses. And this is really the true engine for turning poor countries into rich ones. That's what's ha what happened here, that's what happened in Europe, and that's what's happening in Asia. Uh, we're also seeing growing foreign investment in Africa. I think this is obviously, it's led by oil, gas, and mining. These are the traditional sectors, very uh, uh, capital intensive. Uh, but there are also very, very exciting trends in other sectors, such as telecommunications, agribusiness, and business services. I think countries, even, like, you, even small countries like Ghana, are starting to, to build niche markets in the back office, uh, business services, uh, the kinds of things that India has been able to do very successfully, where you have uh, uh, very high wage uh, jobs, high wage for, for Africa, very, very, very low wage for, uh, for Americans, uh, but um, really good kind of white, um, white collar uh, jobs uh, that Africa has not, has not really had. We're also starting to see a lot more interest from uh, private equity firms, from the big investment houses. Uh, I hope somebody from T. Rowe Price is here. Uh, from some of the hedge funds, 
um, uh, that had never looked at Africa before. A lot of the hedge funds in New York and London and sprinkled around the country are starting to look at some of these opportunities. Um, and a lot of non-traditional investors. Um, and I think all of this bodes very well for Africa's integration into global financial and business networks. Um, now, I think indicative of this interest, uh, Africa was recently featured for the first time ever on the cover of Business Week. It's a very interesting story. Um, another encouraging trend we're seeing is the return of a lot of African professionals from the United States and Europe and Canada going back to Africa. We see this quite a lot in the financial world where a lot of the banks in Nigeria and Ghana, throughout West Africa, a lot of these new funds are actually being run by Africans that left maybe 20 years ago. They worked on Wall Street, they worked uh, in the city in London, and now they're going back and starting their own funds. Um, and so I think that it's pretty clear to us that, you know, it's, it's up and down, but the big, the big trajectory in Africa is positive in terms of conflict, in terms of democracy, in terms of economic prosperity and opportunity. Now, all of these things are, of course, very, very fragile. 2007, I think, was uh, probably the best year for Africa, certainly, that I can remember. Uh, 2008 is starting a little bit of shaky ground, so I think that's a good reminder that, uh, uh, that there are some significant pitfalls out there. Um, now, to encourage this success and to try and contain these problems, uh, the United States uh, is very, very actively trying to re-engage with the continent. Now, history, I believe, will show that, um, that our policy toward Africa is, is one of the shining legacies, if not the shining legacy, uh, certainly of the Bush administration. Um, after the end of the Cold War, Africa got kind of lost in the shuffle as people figured out, you know, now what do we do without our, our central focus of, of, of Soviet containment? And without an overarching reason or rationale for giving foreign aid anymore, um, if you look at who we gave a lot of foreign assistance to uh, in the 70s and 80s, it was our Cold War allies. Without that rationale, uh, our interests waned um, uh, and a lot of our, our assistance uh, waned. In, in the middle of the 90s, it really just plunged uh, uh, to, to almost insignificant levels. And we had some particular uh, issues of the tragedy in Mogadishu where the Black Hawks were shot down in October of 93. Things certainly made uh, uh, U.S. officials very reluctant to get involved in complicated and often dangerous African conflicts. This contributed to us sitting on the sidelines in 1994 during the Rwanda genocide, uh, and I think that's really a low point uh, of U.S.-Africa relations. Um, without a guiding rationale, you know, the U.S. was a little bit lost as to what to do uh, in the mid-90s. Now, fortunately, that started to, uh, started to pick up uh, after this low point. Um, and I think it, it carried on quite strongly, in fact, it accelerated uh, after 2000, 2001. I think to many people's surprise, uh, I was actually living in England uh, 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 at the time, um, uh, Africa turned out to be one of the centerpieces of, of uh, this administration's foreign policy. Uh, as many of you may know, the President, Mrs. Bush, just very, very recently returned from a five-country um, a tour of Africa. This was the president's second visit to the continent and the first lady's fifth. Um, and these trips, you know, they look good, they generate a lot of good PR, but they're actually a lot more important than that because the stops that they make and, 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 and the discussions they have and the projects that are visited are really reflective of U.S. policy and, and trying to show where we're engaging, how we're engaging, and why we're trying to engage uh, with Africa. Uh, at the most basic level, we're really very actively trying to solidify our presence on the continent. As the sole global superpower, everybody expects the United States to be everywhere. In Africa, we have 45 Afri uh, active embassies. I, I don't know if we have any um, uh, foreign service officers here, um, but 45 embassies is a lot. Uh, there are a lot of countries where we are, you know, if not the only one of only one or two embassies uh, there. Uh, and we've been building new embassy compounds. We built 16 new embassy compounds in Africa since 2001. Right now there are five under construction and there are 20 more uh, slated to get started uh, within the next six years. Um, now this investment um, will pay massive dividends in the future by allowing us to have eyes and ears on the ground, in country, and will allow us to robustly engage with uh, our African partners for many generations. 
Um, it's also an important symbol that America is not shrinking away from the world, that we're there to stay uh, through these, these investments. If you're able to travel to Africa, if you can see some of these new embassy compounds, they're, they're quite significant buildings. Um, the administration. Excuse me. The administration has also taken the lead on the policy front, more importantly than, than what buildings we're building, uh, uh, on securing debt relief, on accelerating our aid program, and on boosting trade and investment. Now, in so doing, we're meeting our commitments that we've made at the United Nations and at the G8, uh, and we're laying a, a, a very, very solid foundation for the next administration. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, well, I'll come back to this, I guess, in the questions, but I think that the uh, uh, the politics in Washington have really changed, and I think that uh, strong engagement with Africa, regardless of who is uh, uh, our next president, I think will remain a, a bedrock of U.S. foreign policy. Um, uh, so on, on debt relief, uh, the U.S. took the lead and was able to secure what's called the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative in 2005. Uh, Bobby Pittman, somebody maybe some of you know, he's now the president's lead Africa advisor at the National Security Council. He was actually at the Treasury Department at the time and was the architect of, of this debt relief initiative. Um, and this debt relief initiative was the third phase of what's called HIPIC. That's the IMF and World Bank's Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Program. It's kind of been, uh, they've been expanding it. This was the third big expansion, and this actually allowed countries to move to 100% debt relief from the major financial institutions. Now, so far, this has reduced $34 billion in debt uh, for 19 African countries. And depending on what happens, it could eventually help uh, up to 33 countries uh, wipe the old debt uh, uh, slate clean. Now, the aid budget um, has also been skyrocketing. Total U.S. assistance to Africa uh, more than doubled between 2001 and 2004, reached about $4.5 billion that year. Uh, and then at the G8, the big G8 that Tony Blair hosted at Glen Eagles in Scotland, uh, everyone in the G8 agreed to double their aid assistance again. So we've promised to do that by 2010. I'm happy to say that we are well on track uh, uh, to meet that promise. Uh, and I think if you ask, um, uh, if you really press us, I think we're going to more than exceed that. Um, now, these increases have been the result of, quite frankly, the President's uh, demands that we meet the humanitarian and strategic interests of the United States around the world. Um, but really, uh, our engagement with Africa, our aid program, is not about spending money. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you, uh, but it's not about spending money. It's about matching our resources to our foreign policy goals. It's about making wise investments. And it's about helping to create the right incentives for the future. And this is why the administration <coughs> has launched a series of innovative and uh, ambitious, very ambitious new programs, not just spending aid in the old way that we did in the 70s and 80s that often led to these accumulations of debt, but trying to do it in a new way, in a better way, that has accountability, we're able to measure results, uh, and will we'll turn out better uh, uh, for the taxpayer, because these are, after all, uh, public dollars that are being used. Um, now, one example of this um, uh, is, the, uh, is the Millennium Challenge account, which I, I hope some of you have heard of. Um, this embodies a lot of the principles and ideas of, uh, of where foreign, po foreign aid thinking is going. The MCC was launched as a new model to support governments uh, uh, that rule justly, that invest in their people, and encourage economic freedom. Uh, and we, if there's interest, I can talk about how that program works and why it's different. But so far, the, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation has signed eight compacts in Africa. They haven't really spent very much money yet because it's taking a little while to get these compacts signed and going. Uh, but they've committed about $3 billion uh, to these eight countries so far. Uh, I'll talk about a few of the other programs in a minute. Um, but lastly, I just want to touch on trade and investment. There has been progress. I'll give you a few uh, data points in a minute. Uh, but I think that, that actually this is the area where the U.S. And, and our G8 partners, we've really not done what we had hoped uh, to set out to do. Uh, on debt relief, on aid, I think uh, very, very high marks. On trade, on trade, not so good. And this is largely because we've been unable to secure uh, a global trade agreement in the Doha round of the WTO. Uh, now let me turn to uh, what we call our pillars of U.S. engagement with Africa. Uh, now we have 
uh, four broad sort of uh, themes or priorities that we use to think about, you know, what are we doing uh, when we, uh, what are we doing, what are we trying to achieve? So the first is to, is to support the spread of political freedom and strengthen these young, vibrant democracies. Second is to reinforce African initiatives to end conflict and to fight terror. Third is to, to address the unique challenges of HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And lastly, is to expand economic opportunity and economic growth. Now, on good governance, the U.S. Uh, directly supports the spread of political freedom, uh, and we seek to strengthen young democracies. We do this through active diplomatic engagement, through technical assistance to electoral bodies, and we try to work with local institutions and local uh, civil society groups to help build uh, transparency and accountability that are necessary for democracy to deliver on, on the great expectations that the people of Africa have for democracy. Uh, our emphasis on security in Africa has been uh, mostly to use our diplomatic muscle to try and help end conflicts. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's not a coincidence that as soon as something, uh, there's an outbreak of violence, even in a former French colony, uh, it's often uh, us that gets called first and, we, and uh, we're expected to play an active role, even if it's not a place where we have uh, a big engagement. Uh, I think this is part of our responsibility as, um, uh, as, as the sole glo global superpower, and it's also we um, uh, are often seen in Africa uh, as an honest broker. I think one of the striking things, is if you look at uh, the Pew um, polling numbers, uh, are U.S. favorable ratings uh, in Africa are the highest of anywhere in the world. In fact, <laughs> You know, quite a few African countries, they think more favorably of us than we do ourselves. Um, <laughs> the, the, the other part of that, other than using diplomacy, is peacekeepers and training peacekeepers. Uh, since 2005, we have committed uh, uh, significant funds to training peacekeepers. We've trained over 39,000 African peacekeepers in 20 countries. This is an ongoing program. Um, I'll talk about Darfur in a minute. Um, uh, but these efforts actually pay dividends greater than just getting a battalion into a conflict to help secure the peace. Uh, by helping to professionalize and equip African militaries, especially if we're very good about vetting them so that we're working only with, uh, 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 with, the, with the most reliable partners, we actually gain invaluable partners to help us deal with a range of other issues beyond conflict resolution, a range of transnational threats of the 21st century, such as international crime, arms trafficking, and international narcotics trafficking. Now, I don't, I don't want to be um, uh, alarmist, but there is also a very, very real threat of terrorism in Africa. Uh, the bombings of the U.S. embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were unfortunately not, not anomalies. Uh, in particular, in 2006, an Algerian-based terror group called the GSPC announced that it was formally now part of Al-Qaeda. Um, it's now called, uh, we call it AQIM or AQIM, it's Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, it's still relatively small, but it's very active. Uh, its attacks have mostly been, because it was originally Algeria-based, mostly been in Algeria, which in the State Department is actually dealt with in, um, in the Middle East Bureau. Uh, but it's been increasingly operating uh, throughout the Sahel, throughout that West African band. Uh, and we've seen uh, uh, increased recruitment, targeting of, of Western interests, uh, Western uh, individuals. Um, and then there's also a, a worrying trend of copycat groups. There's a group in Nigeria called the Nigerian Taliban. Now, it has no links um, uh, to Afghanistan, but they're trying to replicate some of, uh, some of those tactics. And these kinds of groups uh, are potential threats to our partners and to our own interests uh, in these countries. Now, the irony of this is that Islam in Africa has traditionally been an extremely open, tolerant, and moderate uh, uh, strain. Um, the vast majority of Africans, vast, vast majority of Africans, reject extremism uh, in the region. Um, uh, I was just actually recently in northern Nigeria. I, I, was, uh, um, I was able to visit the Sultan of Sokoto. He is the, uh, the sort of supreme Islamic leader uh, in that region. He's the Islamic leader for about 70 million uh, Muslims in that area. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the open uh, arms that I was welcomed uh, was quite remarkable. Uh, and they talk quite, quite openly about how um, 
about how they need to, uh, about, about tolerance and promoting intra-religious dialogue and making sure that, that their area does not become uh, a recruit, recruiting ground for extremists that they see, they view as external interlopers trying to come in, take advantage of, of, of young people. Um, um, and so African countries, though, still have limited capacity in terms of intelligence, military, in terms of development and public relations to really uh, uh, to have the capacity to deny terrorists uh, safe havens, recruiting, and financing. Um, now, we have a program called the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership. Uh, one of the shocks of working in government is the uh, proliferation of acronyms. Everything has a long acronym. Um, uh, so we call it the TSCTP, just to complicate matters. The Pentagon calls it uh, uh, OEFTS. Uh, so sometimes it's called TSCTP, OEFTS. Um, uh, but what this does is it, it's, it's an umbrella that mobilizes different government resources from the State Department, from the Pentagon, and from USAID to help partners in West Africa improve their ability to safeguard their borders and to deny operating space for terrorists. Uh, it tries to address some of the underlying conditions that can produce extremism, particularly among the young unemployed, young unemployed men uh, and those that are trying to bring extremist ideology into uh, the mosques. Um, now we're developing a similar interagency model in East Africa. Um, now, investing in people, this third pillar, is really, if any of you have heard President Bush talk about Africa, this is where he personally is, is really the, the, the most passionate. Uh, in 2003, he launched the President's Emergency Plan uh, for AIDS Relief, also called PEPFAR. Now, PEPFAR committed $15 billion over five years to combat global HIV AIDS. Most of that was in Africa, which is, of course, the region hardest hit by HIV AIDS. Uh, now, PEPFAR is the largest international health initiative in history to fight a single disease. Now, through this program, the U.S. partners with local African communities and organizations to support HIV AIDS treatment, care, and prevention activities. Today, PEPFAR is, is supporting uh, ARV treatment uh, for about 1.3 million people uh, in Africa. Uh, last May, the, the five years is coming up to an end, so President Bush proposed it was, it was so successful, it was so well received, I think there, there's so much support for it that he proposed to actually double it to $30 billion over the next five years. Uh, and Congress has actually indicated they want to do a lot more. The number $50 billion is being thrown around uh, up on Capitol Hill. Uh, now the number one killer in Africa is not AIDS, and it's not war, it's actually malaria. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that I've had <laughs> malaria. I know it's a terrible disease, but I was lucky enough to have medicine to cure me. Uh, but in 2005, the president launched, uh, the, it's called the Presidential Malaria Initiative, and that committed $1.2 billion over five years to re, with a target to reduce malaria deaths in Africa by 50% in these 15 target African countries. Now, this initiative has already reached about 25 million people in Africa, and in one of the early places where they targeted is the island of Zanzibar, uh, just off the coast of Tanzania. Uh, and the, there the U.S. helped deliver uh, bed nets, which are insecticide-treated nets that you put over uh, children when they sleep, uh, the indoor spraying, and uh, mal uh, medicine for people that, that do catch malaria. And as a result of this program, the infection rate's gone from 20 percent to less than 1 percent. Essentially, the program has worked. It's eradicated malaria in Zanzibar. Um, during his, uh, his recent trip, it was about two weeks ago, uh, the president also announced a new $350 million program to tackle seven what are called uh, neglected tropical diseases. Um, and uh, uh, you probably haven't heard of most of these because they are neglected tropical diseases. Uh, but uh, uh, two of them, for example, are river blindness and hookworm. Uh, and he's called, he's, he's really laid down a marker of U.S. leadership on this issue, and he said, we'll put in $350 million, we need about a billion dollars, and he's calling on our European and other allies to put up the other $650 million. Now, uh, one, one side point I just want to make on PEPFAR. Um, I think during the trip and around, around town, you'll, you'll often see a lot of very, very good press about PEPFAR. It's one of the most popular programs uh, that we have. Um, including by a lot of people that were criticizing the, uh, the U.S. government for not doing enough uh, to fight HIV-AIDS. Um, but the, the, the recent press has actually been quite good. Uh, but I have also noticed that virtually every story that, 
talks about all the good things that PEPFAR has done uh, has, a, um, uh, has a but at the end. And the but is a small provision in the, in the, uh, in the legislation um, uh, that um, allocates money for abstinence programs as part of the, as part of the prevention uh, piece. Now, I think a lot of this has been misunderstood. First of all, um, it is true that, that a, portion of the, a portion has to be uh, allocated toward, ab toward promoting abstinence. But this to of the total, it's only about 7 percent. So it's not, it's often thrown around that it's a third or it's some, it's some huge amount. It's about 7 percent of the total is supposed to go to that. It's also not true that this is sort of some uh, uh, foreign or American idea that's being forced on unwilling African governments. Uh, the ABC approach, which stands for abstain, be faithful, and use condoms, actually comes from Uganda, uh, which was one of the countries the worst hit uh, and is one of the countries that's sort of the most forward-leaning in trying to uh, uh, prevent uh, and contain uh, HIV AIDS. Um, there's also, quite frankly, uh, a political angle. Uh, PEPFAR's massive success, its bipartisan support, is in no small part due to extremely strong support on Capitol Hill uh, from conservative groups. And many of these groups have traditionally been very skeptical of big, big aid programs. Um, and I think this is actually a, a bigger, a bigger uh, uh, observation. I, I, you know, I come from a, a think tank in, in the academy, um, I'm not a, a career a civil servant. And so I, I really found it quite remarkable to watch the politics of aid in Washington. Uh, and I really don't think it's too strong to say that the single biggest change in Washington that has enabled these increases in aid, in HIV AIDS, for child health, for, these, for, for global health, has really been the swing among conservative religious groups to support these programs. Um, the last pillar I want to talk about is promoting economic prosperity. And really, again, my, my economist bias is showing here, but I think this underlies everything. Uh, if the next 50 years for Africa is going to be better than the disappointing last 50 years, then the continent has to grow quickly. Uh, it has to create jobs. It has to generate wealth. And for democracy to thrive, Africa ha African economies need to create a vibrant middle class. Middle, the middle class is the bedrock of democracy. Um, now, in addition to the aid numbers that, that, that I told you about, U.S. trade with Africa has also been expanding. Uh, there was a very successful program uh, of President Clinton's called the African Growth and Opportunity Act. We call it AGOA. Uh, there are now 39 countries that are AGOA eligible. Uh, it's over 4,000 product lines that are eligible to come from Africa into the U.S. Uh, duty free. Uh, and this accounts for about 98 percent of African uh, uh, goods that enter the U.S. Now, two-way trade between Africa and the U.S. Now, is now about $71 billion, uh, thanks in part to AGOA. A lot of that is, of course, oil, but it's not just oil. Uh, Non-oil imports from Africa to the U.S. have been growing on an average of about 18 percent per year since 2001. Now, this is, of course, very positive, but market entry, the barriers that we have that might keep products out, is really only a very small part of what's holding Africa back from asserting itself in, in the global economy. Uh, now, Africa's share of global trade was about 4 percent a generation ago. It's now down to only about 1.5 percent. And the way to turn this around, uh, we need to fix our own trade policies so they're not keeping African products out uh, unfairly. But the key to turning it around is really getting African companies and the African private sector going and unleashing all that tremendous entrepreneurial energy that's, uh, that's latent and in the continent. Um, now, this is really getting the private sector going, getting African businesses going, is the key to turning Africa from a region of mostly poor people to one that provides real economic opportunities. Now, we, the U.S. government, work very closely with our international partners to try to improve access to capital for entrepreneurs, to try to make the business climate in some of these countries much more business friendly, uh, and to try to build entrepreneurial skills. Now, there are several exciting initiatives in private investment, especially from a U.S. agency called OPIC. Uh, and I'll talk about these in a minute. Uh, but first, I want to just say that, uh, that one trend that, I, that I've certainly uh, found quite, quite striking is that uh, we've, t we've had improved economic management in Africa, uh, and we've had debt relief. And these two things have combined uh, to kind of give Africa a fresh start. And we're starting now to see countries uh, return to the capital markets. 
And this is what we would hope to see. We want to see countries in Africa behave like countries everywhere else. Um, and uh, some of this has been helped by U.S. technical assistance. It's not just the debt relief. We actually have uh, technical uh, people that come in and can help uh, just tweak things to get them right. For example, there was a U.S. Treasury advisor in the finance ministry in Ghana that helped <coughs> Ghana launch a very successful $750 million, Euro, uh, $750 million Euro bond issuance uh, not that long ago. Um, now, private sector barriers, what's holding back all these entrepreneurs in Africa is too often problems in the public sector in Africa. It's the governments holding them back. Uh, we see this in uh, some of the data that the World Bank puts out when you see ridiculous statistics about you know, how many signatures you need uh, to export goods or how many days it takes to start a business. Uh, and just having those numbers uh, has really been an important first step in getting countries to identify what are the problems. You know, why is the private sector not taking off? And you say, well, look, why does it take uh, three years uh, to, uh, to start a business? Or why do, you need, uh, why do you need to spend 10 times the average person's annual wage in order to buy a license? These are kinds of things that governments can, can fix if they really want to. And actually presenting them with that information and seeing if they do fix it is a good way to try and see how serious they are. Uh, and we do have programs uh, to help reform business regulation, try to make it easier to own, operate, and grow businesses. Um, we are active participants, uh, often with the World Bank and some of our other partners, uh, to encourage better economic management, uh, such as publishing your budget, promoting good, sound accounting principles, uh, and a whole range of industry-specific initiatives. There's something called the Kimberly Process, which tries to squeeze uh, conflict diamonds out of the system. There's something called uh, a terrible acronym called the EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which tries to improve reporting on oil and mining contracts so that all the great uh, uh, wealth in the ground in Africa, which has not benefited most people in the past, will start to benefit people uh, in, uh, more widely. Uh, and here we've actually seen some great strides through some relatively simple measures in a short period. Nigeria, in particular, through implementing some very basic budget rules, has been able to save its oil windfall. In the time of an oil, a very high oil prices, they always just spent everything, and nobody knows where it went. Uh, we have some guesses, uh, but it certainly didn't stay in Nigeria. Uh, but now we're seeing them save their oil windfalls. The central bank, their reserves are absolutely uh, uh, exploding. They've used that money to buy back all of their debt. Uh, they're now returning to the capital markets to borrow again, and we're starting to see a real economic boom uh, take off in Nigeria. Nigeria uh, is another country I, I, I work on every single day, and I do realize it's a complicated, uh, um, a fragile uh, place, but I do think that we are at, at a very important moment in Nigeria where things are really starting to take off. Um, Liberia, actually, a country that really went to the bottom, um, uh, everything was devastated through a brutal civil war, is actually a, a success story uh, with its very high standards of financial and budget management. Uh, in fact, it's at, still at one of Africa's poorest countries, but it is setting the standard for how do you manage your own resources. And it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, going to set a big example for, uh, for a lot of their neighbors. Um, now, before I move to the last section of my talk, I want to highlight uh, the one uh, often unsung U.S. government agency that I think is doing a lot of innovative things. Um, and it's not the State Department. <laughs> um, it's called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPIC. Uh, and they actually have been doing some wonderful new work in Africa. Um, their, their traditional line of business is to provide risk insurance for investors uh, in developing countries. Uh, they also have, have uh, been setting up funds. Uh, they help to provide seed capital, uh, and, uh, and to try and get targeted private, usually private equity funds uh, going in areas where, where uh, there's a little bit of a, a hole in the market. Now, they, these funds leverage OPEC's credit lines, uh, and they use the weight of the U.S. government to try uh, to provide seed capital and get things going. Um, they provide capital to new markets. They try to add new diversified vehicles, and they try to help develop local capital markets so that they won't be needed. Now, last year, OPEC mobilized about $750 million uh, through three new Africa-focused private equity funds, including ones that targeted infrastructure and housing. 
Last month, OPEC just announced five new funds uh, that's going to have a target capitalization of about $875 million. Uh, now, when I say target capitalization, this is not U.S. taxpayer dollars. Uh, what these are, first of all, OPEC is a net uh, money maker for the U.S. government. Uh, they're, they're very successful in their business line. It is a U.S. government agency, but they're self-financed. Uh, and then what they often do will, put, will be to put in a proportion of the funds uh, to get going. They uh, farm out the management to private managers, and those managers need to bring in uh, additional private capital. Uh, it's a very successful model. Uh, so they've now launched five new funds uh, to, to try and raise almost $900 million to invest in private health care in Africa, property, uh, technology sector, to develop uh, local bond markets, and uh, SME finance, which is small and medium enterprises. Uh, in addition, OPIC set up uh, something called the Liberia Enterprise Fund. Now, this is actually working with uh, Bob Johnson, the entrepreneur from BET TV, um, and they're going to provide about $30 million in SME finance just in Liberia uh, to try and, get, uh, try and get some small and medium-sized businesses going uh, as that recovery starts to pick up. Um, uh, so I'll take, uh, I think, questions about specific countries and issues uh, at the end in a few minutes, but let me just try and preempt just a, a couple of those that I'm guessing people are interested in. First is, of course, Kenya. Uh, the violence that followed the, the very flawed election in Kenya shook not just Africa, I think it shook everybody. Uh, Kenya had been, of course, very stable, a responsible regional leader, a very close ally of ours uh, in the region, and it was also doing quite well, it's one of the more prosperous countries. Now, during the, the recent crisis, the international community, uh, including the African Union, which is the kind of UN, the regional UN uh, uh, of Africa, made clear that national reconciliation had to take place, that the, that the opposition leader and the, and the president needed to come to some deal. Now, from the outset of the crisis, the U.S. was very, very actively engaged. Uh, my immediate boss, Assistant Secretary Jendai Frazier, uh, was almost immediately in Nairobi. Uh, she was there for about 10 days, shuttling between the two and tr laying the groundwork for, uh, uh, for the eventual settlement. Uh, Secretary uh, Condoleezza Rice was with President Bush on, on the trip to Africa, on the five-country trip, and she broke off to fly to Nairobi uh, to underscore the U.S. Uh, uh, commitment uh, uh, to Kenya and to underscore our insistence that the two parties come to a reconciliation. Now, we're, of course, extremely pleased that former U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, was able to broker a power-sharing agreement between President Kibaki and Raila Odinga, the opposition leader. Now, of course, it's, it, it, it's one thing to get a, an agreement on paper, but the, uh, the proof will be in its implementation. Uh, they're still negotiating over uh, cabinet posts. Um, and more importantly, uh, the two leaders really have to convince their supporters, uh, who've just been involved in horrific uh, violence, uh, to refrain from further violence and to accept the whole idea of shared power. Um, in that vein, the U.S. remains very committed to contribute to the agreement by remaining engaged, continuing to press them uh, to stick to their, to, to their commitments, uh, and we will, uh, we will be funding uh, additional democratization and rule of law programs. Uh, secondly, Darfur. Um, uh, in Sudan, our primary goal is to see a peaceful end to the crisis in Darfur. We have spent over $4 billion uh, since 2005 on humanitarian assistance, peacekeeping, on development assistance, and on reconstruction uh, in Sudan. Uh, a tremendous amount, by far and away, the most money uh, that we're spending in Africa. Um, uh, in order to, keep, to, to secure the peace, we are pushing for a rapid deployment of UNAMID, it's the UN uh, peacekeeping force, uh, and we will pay about a quarter of those costs. Uh, when it's fully deployed, UN peacekeepers will number about 26,000. This will be the largest peacekeeping force in UN history. Um, and we expect those peacekeepers, once they're deployed, to provide security for all the people of Darfur. Uh, right now, uh, we're trying to get those troops deployed as quickly as possible, and we are pushing through many different means the Sudanese government to stop blocking that, uh, so some of the various impediments to, to getting the peacekeepers in. Now, of course, Darfur, getting the peacekeepers in is just the very first step. The, the resolution to the crisis in Darfur will not be re resolved militarily. 
Uh, there must be a politically negotiated peace settlement between the many rebel groups and the government. Here we're backing the diplomatic efforts of the UN and the AU special envoys that are trying right now to help broker that peace. And finally, I think, you know, a lot of attention is on Darfur, but Darfur is only sort of half of the Sudan problem. Uh, we have to keep our eye on the ball of southern Sudan and the implementation of the, what's called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the CPA, which ended 21 years of civil war between the North and the South. Uh, now, this was signed uh, three years ago. It's supposed to have a number of provisions to move toward national reconciliation. Key moment will be next year uh, when there's supposed to be national elections. But the CPA, we still believe, provides a realistic framework for a peaceful democratic Sudan in the future. Uh, again, this is going to require incredibly intense uh, engagement and, and uh, unfortunately, a lot more resources. Uh, let me say a word about uh, AFRICOM, um, which is the Pentagon's new Africa command. Um, I know that there's been a lot of press on this, uh, a lot of reaction, some of it uh, hysterical in the negative, some of it hysterical in the positive. And despite all this noise, actually, AFRICOM's not that big of a news story. It's not that much new. Um, uh, the U.S. has always provided humanitarian disaster relief and technical assistance in a range of areas, including peacekeeping, uh, when asked by African nations to help out. Uh, now, what's happening today with AFRICOM is that we're restructuring uh, our Department of Defense assistance to put it under one roof instead of three. Uh, instead of Africa being dealt with by uh, as the second, third, or fourth tier priority of three different regional combatant commanders, uh, they've now just taken those away and put them under one roof. Uh, so there's now one single combatant commander whose number one priority is U.S. engagement uh, in Africa. Uh, that commander is, is General Kip Ward. Uh, now, AFRICOM is very unique in one particular and very important way. Much of the staff comes from non-Pentagon uh, agencies. One of General Ward's two deputies is a career State Department official. Many of you may know Mary Carlin Yates. She was our ambassador in Ghana. Uh, and no decisions, despite all of the hullabaloo, have been made on AFRICOM's location. Uh, that's unfortunately gotten a lot of the public attention. And for the foreseeable future, that will stay in Stuttgart, uh, Germany, where uh, UCOM is. Uh, one last point on UCOM is that it is a command. It is not a base. Uh, it's not a military base. Uh, I was in Nigeria. They are absolutely convinced that this is, means the Marines are coming into the Niger Delta and we're going to set up a big naval base. Absolutely not. In fact, AFRICOM comes with no new troops. Uh, and it's more likely to look like an office building than a naval base. Uh, the U.S. has no plans for deploying new, uh, new U.S. forces in Africa. Uh, there is a small contingent called the Joint Task Force for the Horn of Africa based in Djibouti. Um, but there are no new forces planned. Now, let me end. I started by talking about Liberia and, and Baltimore's links, so let me end with Liberia. Uh, the United States' historical and cultural ties to Liberia, a uh, small West African country, are stronger and deeper than with any other country in Africa. Uh, but the importance of Liberia to us is a lot more than just history. Uh, we played a central role in ending its civil war in 2003, and we are viewed by the international community as the lead uh, in, uh, in shaping its post-conflict recovery. And in fact, our engagement there is unlike anything that we have anywhere else in Africa. Um, it is a major piece of the President's legacy in Africa. We've spent about $750 million in Liberia since 2004, and this support is going to continue. Uh, our development efforts stress good governance, anti-corruption, uh, so that the future um, is for the Liberian people, not for the enrichment of a few elites. Um, and we're investing in essential education and health services, and we're rebuilding, given what happened, the police and army from scratch. Now, I draw two main lessons from our success in Liberia so far. First, there has been very broad and very deep bipartisan support for helping Liberia recover. Support on Capitol Hill actually is just remarkable. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, and I'm optimistic that that will continue in the future. Second, and here's where Liberia's success could have major implications across the continent, is that we have a very reliable partner in President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who maybe some of you have had the opportunity to, to meet. Um, she's shown tremendous personal courage and great leadership to really get Liberia back on track. 
Thank you for uh, having me here today. I hope I've highlighted a little bit about what, we, what we're thinking about, what we're doing, what we plan to do, and how we engage uh, with Africa in the 21st century. And I'm happy to take questions. How can you encourage uh, private philanthropy and industry, I think you said, NGOs. and NGOs, non-government organizations, uh, to, to help? Well, I mean, the short answer is, uh, is we don't really have to encourage them because they are out there and they are doing wonderful things already. Uh, the thing that we, that, that one of the things that makes the U.S. a little bit unique, certainly relative to our European uh, allies, is that we spend, we, we subcontract the U.S. government subcontracts a lot of the development work. Uh, we, uh, USAID is not like DFID in Britain. Uh, USAID subcontracts a lot to NGOs, to private uh, consulting firms, to all kinds of groups. So the U.S., through PEPFAR, through our regular development programs, is actually funding a lot of the NGOs and partnering with NGOs uh, uh, almost everywhere. Uh, and we see that as critically important. Uh, in the private philanthropy world, I think it's, uh, it's no um, uh, surprise that, that uh, the Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation, some of these private uh, foundations are playing a tremendous role, uh, particularly in areas like global health. Um, uh, and we work very closely with them, uh, and we welcome uh, a lot of the innovations and the flexibility that they have that we don't have uh, to do certain kinds of, uh, certain kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the power of the U.S., you know, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about government programs, but the power of the U.S. is in private citizens, in private activity, uh, and uh, the best face of America is not, um, uh, is not me uh, driving around in a big government vehicle in an African country, but it's the American NGOs that are out there uh, doing great work. Um, we do have, uh, uh, I, I hope some of you have been to, to the Bureau, I think we have a relatively open door. I talk to private groups, um, NGOs, advocacy groups almost every day. Um, and and uh, so I think actually the engagement is, is, is quite positive. Would you um, comment on, on, on China in Africa and our relationship to that particular challenge? Sure. I was actually going to put that as one of my preemptive questions because I always get it, but I thought it was getting a little long. Um, let me say, I'm struck actually by the word of combating China. Uh, we, um, there are a couple of exceptions I'll talk about, but for the most part, we actually view China's engagement with Africa as mostly positive. Uh, we actually have a very good dialogue with China on Africa. Um, this is at the, at the global level. I talked to my counterpart uh, in China on Africa and what they're planning to do. Uh, and at the country level, our ambassadors talk. Um, and um, in, in many countries, China and the U.S. are, 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 uh, are, are two of the biggest players in a particular place. Liberia is a good example of that. Now, why do we view it as positive? Well, actually, China's doing a lot of things that nobody else is doing. Uh, you'll notice I didn't talk about building roads or building ports. Um, the MCC is doing, planning to do a little bit, bit of this. Uh, but in general, we don't do that kind of stuff. The Chinese love to build stuff, and they like to do projects uh, quickly, uh, and they do them, as you might guess, uh, at low cost. Uh, 